Crashed Oreo 2. It's an overhaul mod for Factorio that, quote, adds numerous new buildings, items, technologies, and mechanics to the game. Now, if you've watched my other Factorio videos, you may have come to the assumption that I play this game to torture myself, but I do occasionally play this game for fun, and hopefully this will end up being the latter. You may have noticed that I'm not the Factorio engineer today. I'm a tech priest from Warhammer 40k and the very cool Mechanicus mod. Or is it pronounced Mechanicus because it's Latin? Well, I'm sure some Warhammer lore master can correct me. Anyway, I just thought it was fitting. There's some other mods I'm using on top of Crastorio 2, half of which I don't even use, so I'll just list them all here so no one gets confused. Yep, there they are, and there they go. Okay. Now, the first thing you'll notice is that we've got these damaged assembling machines lying around the crash, as well as a small power source and a damaged lab, which we'll need because this is the only way we can do research until we get the technology that lets us craft our own labs. We're gonna need stone, so we mine some of the 50 billion rocks that Alien Biomes puts all over the place, and move on to the iron. The next thing you'll notice is that you need to set the recipes for your furnaces. You can't just put stuff in. It's a little annoying, but as an intellectual, I know that it's because the person who made the mod wanted smelting recipes that take multiple ingredients and had to code them like assembling machines to achieve that. The next next thing you'll notice is that an iron plate doesn't take one ore, it takes two. Also that the iron plates look different, but that's less important. Anyway, after gathering some iron and copper, we can start thinking about using these damaged machines for research. If there's anything that'll let us automate things, I'm sure it's the research called Automation Core, so let's grab that. In the meantime, I can use these crappy assembling machines to process my iron into gears and save me some time. I wonder why my furnaces are running out of fuel so fast before I realize that they're using 350 kilowatts each. That's almost four times the coal consumption of a vanilla furnace. I guess I can respect the logic behind that. It is a furnace, after all. With automation cores done, we can do... whatever it is we can do with them. That's the fun of overhaul mods. You gotta figure it out. And what it seems we can do is research assembling machines. That broken reactor only makes a pitiful 240 kilowatts. We don't have access to steam power yet, but fortunately we can make wind turbines for an even more pitiful 20 kilowatts each. With four of these, we can power a single assembling machine. Hey, it's better than nothing. By the way, Alien Biomes has several biomes that slow you down to walk on them, and snow is one of them, so I'm gonna be extremely slow all the time. These brick paths will save me a load of time in the future. Assembling machines are done, so now we can do away with these damaged machines. And while I was distracted, the biters took the liberty of eating all of my miners. And then they decided to eat me. I guess now is a good time to mention that Crastorio added actual aiming to the game. Yes, you need to point in the direction you want your bullets to go. You can't just hold space anymore. Anyway, I respawn, deal with the rest of them, and decide I should start taking defense a little more seriously. Normally I wouldn't expect an attack this early, but it's to be expected with a nest that close. Also, I think Crastorio is making my miners and furnaces a little more polluting than usual. As soon as I can craft a machine gun and a shotgun, I decide it's time for a little revenge. After some lead pills from my good friend Dr. Shotgun here, the problem disappears. For now. You might have noticed that purple slimy goo underneath the nests. It's called Creep, and it's a nightmare to walk through, but it plays an important role in this mod, and we'll get to that later. I finished researching steam power, so it's time to upgrade. Check out the length of these underground pipes. As neat as their animations are, these wind turbines are about as useful as they are in real life. A single steam engine outputs 750 kilowatts, which is the equivalent of 38 of these turbines. With that power, we can start assembling some more complicated things, like these automation cores, which are used in red science, I mean, red tech cards, to further our research. You may have noticed that it's 45 minutes in, and I'm still forced to use burner inserters for this. The red tech card also takes these blank data cards, which are an ingredient in all of the data cards, except for the basic one, which you basically make out of wood and some string. Sometimes you have to wonder about the scientific insight you can apparently glean from a sheet of tin foil and a gear, but it's a video game, who cares? Another nest came over to say hi, so it's about time that I set up gun turrets and ammo. And then another attack shows up, but thanks to the power of omega-3 fatty acids, I managed to survive. 
Finally, I've unlocked yellow inserters. Once I get electric mining drills, I'll finally have all of the research you normally start with in the base game. I'm going to need to half-automate this stuff if I ever want to escape hand-feeding hell. It's a little tougher than it is in vanilla, but pretty mild compared to the other overall mods. The yellow inserters are probably the biggest difference since they take these inserter parts to make. With that, we're one step closer to actual automation. As you can see from the corpses, these gun turrets have been doing pretty well for themselves, and it's no wonder. The yellow ammo does twice as much damage as it does in the base game, and the magazines last much longer. I'm gonna be honest, these gun turret buffs might be my favorite part of the mod. With a decent supply of inserters and belts, we can start thinking about upping our production and building a furnace stack. In this mod, stone is more important than it usually is, since we need it to make glass, which is used in several important recipes, but first it needs to go through a crusher to be turned into sand. This mod also comes with a new logistics tool called the Loader, which lets things roll off of a belt and directly into a machine. I say new, but the programming for loaders is actually in the base game, they were just never fully added, and they looked like this. So Crastorio really polished them up. And as you can see, in comes stone and out comes sand. Now we've got copper, iron, glass, and bricks. One step closer to an actual base. But there's something we're missing, and that's steel. But it's not as simple as it is in the base game. Remember when I said I was expecting a smelting recipe with multiple ingredients? Well, here it is. To make steel, we need to combine some iron plates with coke, which we can only get by roasting some wood with some coal. It's not as if we can keep cutting down trees to feed it. We need a steady supply of wood, and that's where the greenhouse comes in. Essentially, they turn electricity and water into wood, and now that we've got some glass, we can actually make a few. They even remove pollution as they work. The greenhouses are greening, and the coke is coking, so now it's time for steel. Easy. We've got everything we need, so now it's time to actually build a base, which I totally haven't been putting off until now. If there's one thing I learned from playing Factorio, it's that the green circuits are important, so we're making those next. They take wood as an ingredient, but they're pretty similar beyond that. I just realized I made the 3-2 wire to circuit assembler arrangement without checking the crafting timer ratios in this mod. It's so ingrained in my psyche I did it without thinking. It's not even optimal here, but I'm not bothering to change it. If I want data cards, I'm gonna need blank data cards. These things craft extremely fast and for very cheap, so we don't need that many to feed a lot of science. I'm still basic, so I need basic tech cards, but these things get phased out pretty quickly. Unlike Vanilla Factorio, where you're using red science from start all the way up to infinite research, in Crastorio, many of these tech cards become completely obsolete, and if red tech cards are CDs, then these basic ones are floppy disks. We'll get everything we need for them pretty quick. I make the red cards real quick, plus the plans to expand once I've actually got enough assembling machines, and after three hours, we've finally got automated science. And after like 30 seconds, we've got green cards up too. While that turns away, I can start automating some supplies. You get to skip the endless trips back and forth hand-feeding iron to make inserters, but I need to live through it. This is one of those put-anything-where-it-fits kind of bases. Getting one iron plate out of every two ores is rough, and with steel taking half, I need some more. Automating all the belt and belt accessories is a little tough, but very important. And this is what inspired me to start automating red ammo. I'm tired of walking in the snow. I want a car. Only problem is, and this is probably my only gripe with this mod, but you can't drive a car without first getting some special fuel, which requires oil processing to get. No more wood-powered cars. And yes, I know you can disable it in the mod settings, but it's only on startup and it's the default, so it's what most people are going to experience. With most of the stuff I'll need fully automated, it's time to start thinking about oil. Remember that special fuel? It takes hydrogen, so I'm barreling some before I head over there, because I want my car and I want it now. 
Fortunately, the oil field isn't far away, so I can just run a pipe straight to my base. Another change Crastorio made is that now oil fields can actually be depleted, and instead of being tied to the richness of the patch, it seems that all pump jacks pump at the same speed now, which, as it turns out, is pretty fast. After making this kludge, I've finally earned my car privileges. This will make moving around 80% less painful. I didn't intend for this playthrough to be in a winter wonderland, it's just how it turned out. Boy am I glad they buffed gun turrets because that is a lot of dead biters. The next thing on our agenda is chemical tech cards. They're basically the equivalent of chemical science in the base game, but where you'd expect engine units and sulfur, instead you have glass and sulfuric acid. The advanced circuits are also different. Instead of plastic, they take these electronic components which take glass, silicon, and plastic. Oil processing is the exact same as it is in the base game, so there's nothing to worry about here. Plastic 2. To make silicon, we're gonna need more sand. We'll filter the sand along with some water to make quartz, otherwise known as silica, and by roasting the quartz in a furnace we can finally create silicon. Combine it all with plastic and glass and we've got electronic components. And with them, red circuits. This is probably a good time to mention another feature in Crast Oreo, the ability to choose which side of the belt the inserters drop on. Yes, no longer are you restricted to only the far side. Here's another feature. Medium electric poles have a supply range of 9x9 instead of 7x7, so they can actually reach the other end of an assembler. Isn't that great? Now all we need is sulfuric acid. The recipe is the exact same as it is in the base game, except doubled for some reason, so no problem there. Also, I want explosives, so enjoy this very spaghetti setup. Now I just need to get all the components to where the blank tech cards come from, and wow. I had no idea red undergrounds were this long. They're a whole four tiles longer than they are in vanilla. Come on, Crest Oreo, you shouldn't be enabling my spaghetti like this. One thing that makes this easier is that all the tech cards have the same crafting time and quantity. They all take 20 seconds to craft and produce five cards, so balancing your science production is as simple as making the same number of assemblers. By the way, here's the ratios for vanilla science for comparison. Now we just yoink some blank data cards, plug them in, and presto, we've got chemical cards up. Much like the base game, this will allow us to research construction robots, as well as electric furnaces and a bunch of new stuff as well. One of those new things is advanced chemistry. I touched on it earlier with the hydrogen I needed to make the fuel for my car, but this adds more of it. It's nowhere near as complicated as the chemistry in a mod like, say, Nullius, so it shouldn't be too scary if you're not a veteran. And remember when I said it takes two ores to make one plate? Well, with this ore washing research, we can recover some of that at the cost of sulfuric acid, which boosts it from a 50% return to a 75% return on your ore, even more if you use productivity modules in the chemical plants. Lots of cool stuff to be sure. I'm running low on power, so I decided to try out these gas-powered engines. They consume 6 petroleum a second to create 4.5 megawatts and a whopping 30 pollution per minute. But to make the same amount with steam boilers would create 60 pollution per minute, plus the 25% bonus pollution that Crast Oreo adds when you burn coal, so this is clearly the superior option. With all this pollution, we're gonna want some military science. Remember that purple creep? Turns out it's one of the ingredients needed to make military tech cards. You can harvest it by hitting Alt plus C and dragging over wherever there's creep. It harkens back to the ancient Factorio days of 2017, when killing biter spawners made them drop alien artifacts, which you use to make alien science. You can eventually automate creep production with a building called a biolab, but you're gonna be getting so much of it it's hardly worth it. And because you won't see me build a single one throughout this whole run, here's its animation. Just look at that pulsing meat. Incredible. The research data also takes coke and steel. I didn't feel like bringing the blank data cards down, so I just made more here. You may have noticed that this base is a bit of a mess, but here's a tip to all beginners. You can excuse any bad design as long as you call it your starter base. Neat, eh? 
Anyway, with military tech cards, we can reliably kill biter nests and start thinking about expanding. We're all out of research that uses basic tech cards, so the military tech can take its place on the belt. Obviously, we want robots next. To make them, it's pretty much the same as it is in the base game, except you need electronic components instead of electronic circuits. I think the biggest difference between Factorio veterans and beginners is how hard they go for bots. I simply can't stress enough how powerful it is to have a fully supplied robot network, especially in mods like this. As long as you automate roboports and provider chests, you can do pretty much everything remotely. An interesting addition Crastorio made is different modes for your roboports. Normal, which is the same as the base game, Construction, which removes the logistics coverage entirely for a larger construction area, and Logistics, which does the same as construction except for logistics. They also increase the connection range between two roboports. Sounds great. Now I don't need to worry about repairing my turrets anymore. Did I mention I like the gun turret buffs? I like the gun turret buffs. After swapping in some passive provider chests, at 7 hours it's time to start thinking about expanding. I couldn't show my face again if I let this base be the center of this video. Remember, this is just my starter base. You know it's serious when he starts automating cargo wagons. Because I'm a sucker for stupid stipulations, I've decided that my real base will be designed entirely around one-to-one -one trains, meaning one engine and one cargo wagon. Basically, I want crossing the street to be as dangerous as possible. Here's something interesting. In Crestorio, if you can ride in it, it has an equipment grid, kind of like the Spider-Tron in vanilla. There's also these portable generators you can fill with coal to power your grid without the need for solar, and these additional engines you can add to make the car drive faster. I also put a robo-port in my car so it can help me build rails. Now it's time to stop beating around the bush and actually get started. I made my own chunk-aligned rail system, meaning that all the blueprints exist within a 32x32 32 32 area. I can do this because Crastorio extended the reach of big electric poles from 30 to 32. Thank you, Crastorio. This means I can assemble my whole rail network like one of those snap-together train sets for kids. Shame about all the biters in the way. Fortunately, we have the best kind of tech. The explosive kind. Just make sure you don't drive into the creep. Because of the slowdown, ramming the nests isn't much of an option, but the range of the tank's cannon is nearly doubled to compensate. I for one support it. Back to rails. Here's a generic mine stop that takes up four chunks. If you notice the problem with the signals, congratulations, you notice it about 20 hours faster than I did. Here's me making a minor design and turning it into a tileable blueprint. It could have been better, but I don't care. Now we just need to repeat that with all the other resources and we can start thinking about the beginnings of the base. But before that, here's another thing Crastorio added. It's an air purifier. It takes air filters as input and absorbs a staggering 75 pollution per minute from the chunk it's in until it spits out a used pollution filter 10 minutes later, which you can run under the sink and reuse later. These things are blatantly overpowered, but I am not complaining. I set up some more mines real quick, at least it's quick for you, and then come across a new resource literally called Rare Metals. Mining it is very similar to mining uranium, except it takes even longer to mine and uses chlorine instead of sulfuric acid, which you'll recall we can get from zapping water with sand. I set up a stop for oil and this stuff called mineral water, but don't worry about that for now. Anyway, that's all the basic resources covered, so onto the actual structure of the base. I think this place to the south of our spaghetti base looks pretty good. It's a well-known fact that 90% of your deaths on the Alien Biomes mod comes from crashing into rocks. These chunk-aligned rails are very convenient. Slowly, a shape emerges. So here's the actual design. The trains go into this one way that feeds into a waiting bay, leading into a series of cells big enough to fit one of our trains that weaves on and off this central track before plugging back into the main line. There's a lot of preliminary stuff I need to set up before this base can start producing anything. I'm going to need this chlorine to mine the rare metals, and once I have the ore I'll need some hydrochloric acid to wash it. 
Again, the chemistry isn't terribly complicated, since most of the stuff you can pull out of thin air with these atmospheric condensers. I'm also making ammonia by combining nitrogen and hydrogen. I don't have much of a use of it for now, but might as well set it up while I'm in the neighborhood. Though the condensers only take electricity to produce this stuff, the crafting times are very long, so you'll need a lot of them if you want any decent amount. Now I need oil refining. I need to do this first because I'm planning on setting up that ore washing stuff I mentioned earlier, and I'll need a steady supply of sulfuric acid to accomplish that. Once again, the oil refining is the exact same as it is in the base game, so nothing scary here. These tanks can hold 200,000 units of fluid. That's eight times as much as the regular tanks. The cracking is also the same. I'm just making sure there's enough space to add a couple beacons should I need them later. Can you believe they made offshore pumps take electricity? Here's where the trains will come to pick up all those neat fluids we just made, as well as drop off crude oil. I had to make a little extension to fit a stop for the iron plates for sulfuric acid because I didn't have enough train stops, but oh well. Speaking of sulfuric acid... Go train and fetch me some oil. While that's on its adventure, I set up some rocket fuel production. They use this new building called a fuel refinery, and there's three different recipes for rocket fuel, but all of them take oxygen and iron. The rocket fuel is pretty different here, since it confers no speed bonus to vehicles, and it has a fifth of its usual burnable fuel value. But finally, we can turn this thing on. We got our acid, now we need to build our smelting, and that starts with ore washing. For that, we'll need another row of train cells. Plus some stops that'll bring the washing fluid. The ore train stops here, and then another train will come to pick up the washed ore. The concept is simple enough, but we'll need a lot if we want to fill a belt. When it's done washing, it outputs dirty water, which we'll need to clean before reusing. That's done in these filtration plants, and this will be enough for all the ore washing I'm planning on doing right now. Cleaning the dirty water results in stone and ore as a byproduct. You can set it to filter out copper or rare metals instead of iron, but I chose iron because I can just route it back into the washing plant already here. The stone I just turn into landfill. This whole process is net neutral on water, meaning that we don't lose any from dirtying it. This means we want to put a limit on how much water can actually enter this tank, otherwise it'd get clogged with the tank already filled with water leaving nowhere for the freshly cleaned water to go and causing a backup. With water and sulfuric acid coursing through its veins, our first ore washing station is complete. So obviously I'm gonna need more, but then I'm like, why am I building this whole thing out of me and my car's inventory when I have a fully stocked base at home? So then I stop being an idiot and actually expand my robot network. Now I'm running low on power, but I'm not really in a good position to set up nuclear power, seeing as I don't even have a uranium mine, let alone Kovarax enrichment yet. Fortunately, we've got oil fields everywhere, and that means petroleum. With just this, we can make 90 megawatts of continuous power. Of course it generates 600 units of pollution a minute, but that's nothing a few air filters can't solve. Eight to be precise. That's all we need to completely nullify this area's pollution, plus one or two for the pumps and refineries. Unfortunately, I'll still need to come here every so often to swap the filters manually, but it's a small price to pay for zero biter attacks. Anyway, now that I've expanded my robot network, building the rest of the ore washing stops is as easy as this. I can build the lane where I'm going to put the forges remotely, too. Each one of these cells fits inside of a chunk, so as long as I keep everything within 32 blocks wide, I could copy and paste another one anywhere I need it. This is the general idea behind a so-called modular base, and the main strength of this kind of setup. The need to set recipes in the furnaces makes this a little more annoying, but it's understandable. While I wait for more electric furnaces to be made, I build a stop for wood, since I'll need it to make the coke and steel and electronic circuits later. I love watching the bots on the map. For all that talk of modular design, here's some not-so-good design. 
This thing here would be difficult to copy to another place and has no waiting area for trains, but I don't really care because all it does is make coke, which we won't need much of and otherwise this entire space would be empty. Look at all these cells just waiting to accept trains. I've got one stop for steel, two for iron, two for copper, and one of rare metals, but I'm not done yet because as far as raw materials go there's still glass and silicon to worry about. Bricks aren't used in pretty much anything, but I'm still going to mass produce them. I'm going to address this now, but if you were wondering about the train stops and the waiting cells, they're gone now. I was trying something, it didn't work, so we're back to basics. I'm not going to go into detail because this video is long enough already, but it was an attempt to make it so multiple trains could be on the central track at one time instead of needing to wait in the waiting cell until the whole lane was clear. Okay. I could have solved it with the Logistics Train Network mod, but I didn't want to pile on too much new stuff for this video. Anyway, back to forges. This lane is less than ideal with all this stuff in the way, but all we need it for is glass and silicon, so it's a level of bad I'm willing to tolerate. Here's some more bad design, making such limited space for these crushers. Well, I'm sure by the time it's a problem, I'll at least have beacons. That's glass, so now it's time for silicon. I probably should have looked at the crafting ratios harder, but nearing 20 hours with only blue tier science, I'm getting a little impatient. But finally, that should be all the basic resources covered. We've got the processing, now we just need the trains to carry the stuff between them. This is all these trains do. They go to a pickup, wait until they're full, and then wait at a drop until they're empty. It's as simple as it can get. Keep in mind that you can have multiple stations with the same name, so if I've got five stations all named Copper or Drop, the trains will be able to choose between any of them and prioritize the stations that are empty instead of queuing behind the same full one. If you haven't guessed, we are going to have a lot of trains by the time we're through. It feels like it's been an eternity, but now it's time to set up the stuff that uses all the resources we've just gathered, and for that we'll need to expand our grid. Remember when I said air purifiers were overpowered? Well, they're currently eating 3.7 thousand pollution per minute. It takes 80 pollution to spawn a big biter, so every minute it's preventing about 50 of those from spawning. They're the only reason I could build this base without first securing a border. But the biters are still annoying, because instead of massive attacks, you get like one biter slipping through my gun turrets and spitting on my trains. Here's where the true form of this design will emerge. For every 32 units, we have two stations above and two stations below for a total of four available stops every chunk. So if we wanted to make circuits, for example, we would use three of those stops for wood, iron, and copper, and load the completed circuits in the fourth station to be shipped elsewhere. It's not an ideal solution, and there's faster designs, but it is a solution. I don't care much for ideal play, and doing the same thing every run would just be boring, so this is what I've come up with. Thanks to Crastorio's ability to choose which side the inserters drop on, I can fully saturate these belts by alternating near and far drops on the inserters. It weirds me out having one wire assembler for two circuit assemblers. Did you know you can add train stops to the schedule by shift clicking a stop on the map? It says so right at the top of the window, but no one seems to notice it. Those trains I just made are now waiting patiently at the forges for copper to appear, while some other trains bring in our first load of enriched copper ore. Wood has arrived. And back from the forges, here's the copper train. See how it fills both sides of the belts? Ah, circuits. It took a lot of work to get here, but now that we are here, making new items is as easy as setting up train stations. Like this plastic here, all I need to do is call a petroleum train and a coal train over and the rest practically makes itself. This kind of design is especially strong for mods when you're not so sure what you'll need and in what amounts. For these electronic circuits, we call our glass train, our silicon train, and our freshly made plastic train. You can see the flexibility in this kind of setup. With circuits and electronic components, we can make advanced circuits, which take one copper wire assembler for every four instead of the usual six. Then with those, we can make processing units, which take rare metals instead of the usual electronic circuits. Oh yeah, it's all coming together. We need some space to craft the actual tech card, so we'll need another lane of train stops before we can get started. By the way, you can't build on creep. 
Just like the base game, we'll need processing units and low density structures for yellow science, but instead of robot frames, we need rocket fuel, which fortunately I've already got set up. With all this production, I need more power, so I set up another gas station. The main thing eating all my power are these electric furnaces. Crest Oreo doubles their power draw from 180 megawatts to 360. We're gonna need productivity modules for our purple science, aka production tech cards. They're probably the most different, since they take processed uranium and fast transport belts as ingredients. With the clock in the top left corner now beginning with one day, I think it's about time I get some actual science going. These blank tech cards should be enough to supply all the science I'll ever need. Here's red and green tech cards. Building these with the knowledge that they'll soon be obsolete kind of hurts, but it is what it is. There's blue tech cards, and finally I can make a new one. You can't make yellow and purple tech cards in assemblers anymore. You need to make them in these special buildings called research servers. I set up the train stops, and now it's just a matter of waiting for them to show up before I've got yellow science. Getting to this point was so much effort, so just let me appreciate this for a moment. I'm going to set up a dedicated lab area eventually, but for now I can just bring these cards to the old labs to finish this very important research. Except for one problem, the old labs can't accept these cards. We need to make advanced labs. At least they look cool. And there's Logistics Network, meaning I'll be able to move items between chests using Logistics Bots. If I were smarter, I would have made a single hand-fed assembler making yellow cards and have this research done 13 hours ago, but whatever. Now I can use my robots to bring fuel to my trains and automatically swap the filters in my air purifiers. If I put it here, I can just route the dirty water in with the water from the ore washing. You didn't need to see it, but I must have spent an hour total going around manually swapping filters and refueling trains, so this research is a godsend. And this is the kind of high-impact blueprinting you can do when your whole base is set to a standard grid. With this many trains and yellow tech cards now online, I want to make sure I've got plenty of rocket fuel to supply the base. Up until now, I've been using the rocket fuel recipe that takes light oil, but now that I think about it, I'd rather turn that oil into petroleum, especially considering I can make the alternative recipe out of thin air. With purple science on the horizon and all this production suddenly straining the limits of my gas power, it's about time I set up a uranium mining. I'm going to need concrete for the centrifuges, but if I'm gonna make some concrete, I might as well make a lot of concrete. And why should I stop at just concrete? I'll make refined concrete too, and even this new stuff Crastorio added called Reinforced Plate. I haven't really had a reason to use them until now, but these warehouses have 500 storage slots, which is over 10 times as many as a regular steel chest. That's a lot of concrete. Going back to my old base, whenever I need supplies is a drag. Plus it's completely out of stone, so I'm making a new supply area here in my second, cooler base. These trains will bring in the basics, like iron, copper, and steel, while everything else will be handled by the bots. Thanks to the power of the logistics network, we can make anything we want without ever needing to bother with belts. Centrifuges are top priority, so we get those set up as soon as possible. Remember to limit your chests when you do this. So the other day, I was playing multiplayer and saw someone manually requesting all of the ingredients across like 50 assemblers for their mall. Please don't do this. Shift right click the assembler and then shift left click the requester chest and all the ingredients that that recipe requires will be automatically pasted into the requester chest. Now I'm eating almost 8,000 pollution a minute. Finally, I get some centrifuges up and start processing the uranium ore. It's the same as it is in vanilla, except you get some random iron and stone as a byproduct. I'm getting flashbacks to last video. Anyway, just set up a few filters and let the bots do the rest. It's nice when automating literally anything you want is but a few clicks away. Let's make it even fancier with all that concrete we automated. 
It's about time I set up the new labs. It's pretty simple. Each kind of tech card just gets its own train stop. I like how colorful it is. Can you believe some people don't properly color their trains? So that's set up, but there's actually not much useful stuff you can make with just these four tech cards. Guess I should hurry up and make purple tech cards already. These are a little weird to make with all the transport belts they take, since each server needs one red belt every two seconds, but I eventually come up with a design that works. Now we just give it its own pretty purple train and we've officially got production science. We might as well make military tech cards too. What in the world caused this abomination? So far we've got 76 trains in the network. With this much science and this amount of production, the normal game would be pretty much over by now, but this is Crastorio. We've still got a ways to go. Cards allowed me to research Kovarax enrichment, so now I can make as much enriched uranium as I want. It's fundamentally the same recipe as it is in vanilla. The numbers are tweaked a bit and it outputs some stone randomly, but the process is the same. Here's my Kovarax setup. I'm not going to explain how it works and you're just gonna need to live with that. I never bothered to mention it until now, but having uranium in your inventory damages you in this mod. Now we can make nuclear power. I'm just going to use this small reactor blueprint from a previous run. Sorry, I'm a busy guy. Nuclear reactors produce significantly more power in this mod, with this 2x2 reactor capable of producing 1.5 gigawatts instead of the usual 480 megawatts. Steam turbines were also buffed, but for a reactor of this size, you'll need 150 to reach the full potential instead of the usual 80. And since we automated everything in that mall of ours, the only manual labor we need to do is hooking up the water. Now we need to make the fuel, and this is the biggest change. You know how you used to get 10 fuel cells from one U-235? Now you get half a fuel cell. Don't even think about building nuclear without Kovarex up. Anyway, the reactors are now humming, soon to be online and relieve me of all my power problems. So then I spent the next two hours adding pretty much anything I could think of to the mall. Then I randomly set up electric engines because I wanted power armor and they're used in a science recipe later, so might as well. Then I go back to automating everything. Can you believe it's been over 30 hours and I'm only now automating blue belts? To be fair, it's probably more of a me problem than the mods. Also, I'm tired of walking through snow all the time, so I gave the bots something to do. After this long, you have no idea how good it feels to have exoskeletons. It's about time I worried about defense. It's easy to forget that my base is still mostly undefended, but that's just how powerful these air purifiers are. Crastorio added a new turret called a railgun that fires these railgun shells, so I figured I'd give them a whirl. It's a little amusing how many weapons and turrets Crastorio added to manage your defenses despite giving you the ability to completely erase all your pollution, but I digress. And there's artillery. Normally I'd be able to steamroll nests without needing artillery at this stage, but Crastorio massively nerfed the strength of personal laser equipment by upping the power drain, so these will help me secure a perimeter. Also artillery shells stack to 20 now instead of 1. I'm sorry, did I just read that the manual targeting range is 960? That's almost double what it is in vanilla. The automatic targeting range is actually a bit lower, but who cares, 960? And look at the blast radius of these artillery shells. I didn't give these things enough credit, they're amazing. I love these buffs. It feels so good when you can just point at something and know its fate is sealed. It's times like this that make the past 30 hours worth it. Since I removed 95% of my pollution, these defenses aren't going to see much action, but they'll at least keep the biters from expanding into my base and being annoying. I didn't need to put this much effort into making it look nice, but I did. There's half my base secured. I'll do the other half later. 
Don't worry about those flashing warning signs, it's just laser turrets. Another feature, Crestorio lets you grow and place your own trees. And since I'm a big idiot, I made a ton of them. You can use these for even more pollution control if your air purifiers aren't good enough, but I'm gonna use them for this. My own personal garden. Yes, I did enter the map editor purely to put the grass inside. Sue me. While conferring no tangible benefit, it does make me obliquely happy. And don't think I was going to move on without showing you what the railgun can do. It one-shots behemoth biters. Making the garden got me in a decorative mood, so I go ahead and fill in all the missing spaces in my concrete. Yes, it is a lot of effort, but it's also a lot of style. I'll cover everything eventually. Well, enough of that. Time to make some actual progress. We're going to need some nitric acid, which takes some of that mineral water I set up like 30 hours ago. It also takes ammonia and rare metals, but we've got them already nearby. I really should have given this a proper stop instead of shoving it into the space next to my garden, but whatever. I also got the rocket silo. Not that it'll end the game, though. No, we've got something more impressive to accomplish for that. Here's something else we'll need later. Sulfur ion batteries. This is from the recipe book mod, by the way, and it's a godsend for these mods. As you can see, shockingly, we need lithium and sulfur to make lithium sulfur batteries. We can make lithium from lithium chloride, and lithium chloride from hydrogen chloride, plus some more mineral water. This and the nitric acid are the only uses for mineral water. The number of trains continues to expand. When you get down to it, all builds involving chemical plants tend to start looking the same. For the lithium, we need to make it in electrolysis plants. The recipe is a little unique because it gives off chlorine as a byproduct, which we'll need to deal with. So after building this, I realized I horribly misread the crafting times and got the ratios horrendously wrong, so I'm gonna need way more electrolysis plants. The easiest way to deal with the chlorine byproduct is to burn it off with a building called a flare stack, but ideally I'd like to reuse it. So I'm setting this up to only burn off the excess when it might overflow, while the rest goes onto this special train that returns it to the chlorine plant. And that's lithium. While you weren't looking, I expanded my rails, and now it's time for the next major step. You may have noticed it on the map, looking all purple, but there's one last resource Crastorio added, Immersite. You extract it from these Immersite caves using a special quarry drill. You're supposed to get a custom achievement the first time you place one, but this is actually my second time placing one because I lost 30 minutes of footage. Yep, it's not one of these videos without some minor technical mishap. Anyway, we're going to need a place to process all this raw Immersite, but that's no problem when your robot network is the size of most small countries. It's like building with Lego. To process the raw mercite, first we need to crush it. And I'm not repeating the same mistake I made with my glass and silicon, I am making tons of these. Crushing the mercite creates as much sand as it does powder, so we've gotta do something about it. We could turn it all into landfill, but I'd rather ship it off to my glass and silicon production since they're chronically low on sand anyway. Another strength of this kind of design. To actually use the powder, we need to turn it into crystals with sulfuric acid and that nitric acid we made earlier. The crafting time to make these is extremely long, taking 30 seconds for one crystal, so we're gonna want a lot of plants. My first batch of raw MRSA just arrived, and just look at it go. The red belts aren't cutting it, but fortunately we can just upgrade them. Here comes the powder. Watching big builds like this come to life for the first time is the most satisfying part of Factorio, somehow even more satisfying than nuking biters. Bonus points for the robot swarm too. And all that for a trickle of crystals. By the way, Crestorio has two tiers of belts higher than Blue Belt. Just thought I'd mention that now. With Immersite crystals up, it's time we talked about the new tiers of tech cards. There's Optimization, Matter, Advanced, and Singularity tech cards. Once we complete all four, we'll be on our way to beating the game. The easiest one is Optimization, since it's basically the equivalent of space science, which means we're setting up a rocket. 
Oh yeah, and those are sulfur ion batteries to your left. I made them during that 30 minutes of lost footage. We've got low density structures and rocket fuel already, so all that leaves is rocket control units, which we'll need another row of cells to set up. We're up to 106 trains now. The RCUs have the same recipe as vanilla, and the speed modules take me about 10 seconds to set up because I can just copy the productivity module build, and then I double it because, I don't know, why not? For the control units, I can just copy the LDS build. And while these splitters aren't a perfect match, it still saves us tons of time. Now there's nothing stopping us from building the rocket. But again, this isn't our win condition. Merely blasting off into the cold depths of space in a homemade rocket isn't enough to save us. We need outside help, and... You know, I'm surprised it took this long. I don't know why I was organizing my inventory on top of the railroad tracks, but now it's time for the walk of shame. By the way, you respawn at this shelter building, which unfortunately is all the way in our old crappy base. After playing with exoskeletons, it's hard to believe I used to live at this speed. I'll just commandeer this other train and have it bring me the rest of the way. Let's just pretend this never happened. These three stops will bring in our LDS, our RCUs, and our rocket fuel. Then this one will take away the space data. So that death inspired me to actually place the shelter in my new base. Now we need a satellite. I'm just going to make it here and let the bots handle it. Here's me making AI cores out of nowhere, even though I was in the middle of launching a rocket and the only thing that really uses them is a tech card I can't even make yet. Also, I totally didn't need this number of assemblers, but my brain just likes seeing this whole space filled. Also, I'm using a lot of processing units now, so it's time to upgrade the assemblers. And then I realize my electronic components are way too slow, and then double it. Basically, doing anything but finishing the rocket. Alright, enough beating around the bush and getting hit by trains. Let's build a rocket. And there's the space data. Now all we need to do is combine it with blank tech cards to get optimization tech. The funny thing is, despite working so hard to get it, turns out it's pretty much the least useful tech card. So I switch over to matter tech instead, which we can only produce in these quantum computers. Turns out those AI cores were pretty important. Unfortunately, all of my immersite crystals are tied up in making AI cores, so then I schizophrenically go back to making space tech. But then it's back to matter cards after the materials have had time to show up. Part of the reason I've been so short on a Mersite is because my nitric acid is insufficient, so hopefully this helps. Even then, it's still too slow, so I do this. Space research is on its way. So while I wait for that to arrive, I check up on my base, look at the production levels, and then I come back to this. Why is it so loud? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Whatever, I'll just try not to stand too close to them. Anyway, that's optimization tech. I've still got some problems with Immersite, but as soon as I throw some in manually, I'll have matter tech. Yeah, I'll just stand over here while I watch it work. Now that I've got the tech, I just need the labs to research it. Just like yellow and purple, these tech cards are too advanced for our old lab, so we need another lab called the Singularity Lab. Despite being four times the size, I set them up in much the same way. Now I just need some more train stops. A total of four for all the new cards. And obviously, I need to color code them. And now our new labs are properly sciencing. They're also extremely loud, but that's half of the new tech done. Look at them next to those puny old labs. 
One of the things I can research with them is a more efficient recipe for electronic components using lithium. Since they're used in modules and advanced circuits, electronic components are in high demand, and I've got a lot of lithium, so this seems great. With that, I've basically tripled my output. I decided to give fusion power a shot, since I might as well. It takes these fuel cells, which you can charge with tritium and heavy water. The heavy water is just from water and electro plant, but the tritium's a little harder. Fusion power is a little interesting, because it requires 500 megawatts to run, but produces up to 2 gigawatts for a net of 1.5 gigawatts. Though, the DT power cells are a fifth as energy dense as a uranium cell, so you'll need to produce a lot of tritium and heavy water if you want to run your base with it. Looks cool though, and it's simple. Water in, steam out. In the process of making fusion power, I realized I'd burned through my entire 12 chests filled with lithium and my production is nowhere near sufficient, so I add another lithium crafting zone. And then I still need more. Turns out lithium is way more important than I realized. So with those two tech cards, I've unlocked a mercium processing, which will allow me to make a mercium plates. And that's good, because the advanced tech cards requires a mercium gears. These plates take a lot of rare metals. Since I've already mass-produced electric engines and lithium sulfur batteries, the gears are all I need to start automating advanced tech. Also, it's about time I secured my other borders. Completely remotely, of course. Also, this gas plant is completely obsolete, but still spews out pollution, so... Problem solved. Now there's only one card left. Making these plates has completely killed our rare metal supply. Fortunately, there's two more mines nearby, and Crastorio has higher tiers of mining drill to help us mine it faster, but seriously, compared to the mid-game where our only drain on rare metals was processing units, must have gone up by a factor of 10. For the final tech card, all we're missing are these matter stabilizers, but they're a doozy. They require three of these energy control units and six immersium plates, and that lets us make one singularity tech card. I guess they saved the best for last. Before I can even think about building them, I need to sort my supply lines out, and that means way more rare metals. Unfortunately, all of the mining has completely killed our chlorine supply. You can see three trains waiting for a tank of hydrochloric acid, which can't be made until the chlorine's backed up. Without hydrochloric, we can't wash the rare metals, and we can't make lithium either, which means we can't make electronic components, and no components means no advanced circuits. This one bottleneck is enough to grind the whole base to a halt. Modules aren't enough, so I gotta shoehorn in some extra production next to my garden. This is a prime example of why you should try to keep your base expandable. Whatever, problem solved. Here's the super secret way to insert four lanes of belts into one assembler. And here's the stabilizers. When they're done, we need to charge them, which is done in this building. I definitely didn't need this many, but stuff like this is how you know I'm going in blind. And just like that, it's charged. Now only a couple more thousand of these and we can beat the game. I've got some unused stops, so I'm just gonna shove it here. It's not pretty, but it fits. And there it is, the final tech card. I haven't really been bothering with them much, but if anything's worthy of four productivity modules, it's these. And now the end's in sight, the Intergalactic Transceiver which will allow us to send a distress call to our home planet. Considering we managed to get this far after starting with nothing but rocks and wood, I'd say we're worth rescuing. But obviously that research is gonna take a while. That last batch of matter stabilizers was about all we could manage for now. But there's still some bottlenecks we've got to deal with, so I up production where I can, add some beacons, upgrade belts, set up more mines, pretty much anything I can find that's an easy fix. Another way to speed up our production is to speed up our trains. I wished I used them earlier, but I only now learned how cool they are. There's a new building called a Tesla coil that can charge the equipment grids of anything nearby as long as it has a charger in its grid. These additional engines don't increase the speed of the trains, but they do massively increase the acceleration. And as long as there's a Tesla coil near the train stop, it can just charge itself. 
Another way to speed it up is to switch over to advanced fuel, which uses a mersite powder, and it's the only kind of fuel that boosts top speed and acceleration. If we combine this with additional engines, our trains will go off like bottle rockets. And if we're killing time, here's another thing we can try. This new, more powerful tank. It's got tons of health and a massive equipment grid. So, let's stuff it full of additional engines and use that advanced fuel we just made. So this is how fast it normally goes, so let's see what happens when we charge it with our Tesla coil. This seems a little ridiculous. Oh, it's not slowing down! That was... genuinely unintentional. Look at how zippy these trains are. Well, it was bound to happen. Behold, the first and only deadlock of this run. With the end soon upon us, it's time we talked matter. Matter is a fluid that can be created from almost any raw resource in a matter plant, which can then be turned into any raw resource using a matter assembler. It's incredibly broken, but does take a lot of power, and it's the end game, so who cares? We're not going to be using it for that, though. We're going to be using it to charge antimatter canisters. Just one of these canisters contains 300 gigajoules. That's 38 times a uranium fuel cell. I'm not going to be using them much, but there's also these advanced buildings you unlock near the end. This one's an upgraded chemical plant, and they are ridiculous. Just one of these combined with the new, more powerful beacons would be enough to replace this entire plastic build. If you're taking this mod to megabase scale, these things invalidate any build you made before them. There's also teleporters, which let you jump between any other teleporter you've placed. While the transceiver's been researching, I've been building antimatter reactors, which produce 3 gigawatts when supplied with an antimatter canister. Why do I need this much power? Because the intergalactic transceiver has a maximum draw of 60 gigawatts. Technically, you only need a minimum of 15 gigawatts to charge it, but that's still 7 times the size of our power grid, so we're gonna need the help. This thing takes a whole 10 minutes to craft. At 50 times speed, you really get a feel for how many trains there are. And there it is. Since it's the end of the game, I gotta make sure we go out with style. While I was decorating, I found this smiley hidden in the advanced plate. Truly, this run has been blessed. Now we turn it on. Transceiver is charging. All 51 gigawatts are being consumed. Almost there. And after loading it with 30 terajoules of energy, it's ready to activate. I'm gonna be honest, I was not expecting it to explode. Anyway, that's the end of the run. Almost 58 hours. Cannot believe it blew up my smiley. Anyway, in the interest of keeping this video under an hour, I'm not going to go into detail, but I liked this mod. I think it changed enough to be interesting, but not too much to be impossible for Factorio casuals. There was also a lot of quality of life stuff I really liked, and the custom models were all very good. 
There's a lot of content I couldn't show because I had to keep this video short, but hey, maybe you should play it yourself. Thank you everyone who worked on this mod, and thank you for watching.